we've just seen the meaning of inverses and now we want to work out how to actually calculate inverses and really there are two sides to this one is going to be algebraic one is going to be graphical so the first will be algebraic so this is actually in theory going to give me an explicit formula for the inverse of a function so recall the following recall what an inverse does it kind of flips inputs for outputs so y is equal to f of x if and only if f inverse y is equal to x so it's basically saying the output is now the input and the input is now the output right reversed and this is for all x in the domain of f and y in the range of f so if i want a formula for f inverse i suppose what i could do would be to take this and then solve it for y if you want or sorry solve it for x because if i was to solve it for x i would end up with this and i would get my inverse expression but it's a little bit confusing because your inverse expression will be in terms of y and that really doesn't matter but i think most of us are more comfortable with functions where x is the independent variable so let's write this in slightly different notation to make it a bit more a bit more standard so alternative notation well, let's just flip the x and the y. So if I was to write y, x is equal to f of y, I'm just changing the notation, nothing profound here, I'm just using x and y kind of differently than before. This is if and only if y is equal to f inverse of x, which feels a lot more natural if I want to work out the inverse. So this is totally equivalent. It's just I'm flipping the notation but x and y just represent numbers as before. It's just now I think about y as an element in the domain of x, or f, sorry, and x is something in the range. It's just turning it. So this is totally equivalent. To the previous statement, uh, we're just switching the notation. So just switching. Just switching x and y. And the only reason I'm doing it is because this is going to be a bit more natural to me when I'm writing down my inverse because it's sensible to write it in terms of x because that's how we normally we write down the independent variable. So here's a strategy then, an algebraic strategy to find an explicit formula for the inverse. So start with x is equal to f of y so basically write down your function but flip the x and the y and then use algebra to solve for y so all of the tools I've been building up throughout the course that's the basic strategy again something to be aware of you shouldn't apply this like a robot because not every function as an inverse so for all this to work f must be one to one in fact if you try doing this with a non one to one function at some at some point the algebra is going to break down so um, just as a quick example So let's take f of x is the function. So what we do? Let's do two x plus one cubed. That function there, shall we? Okay. So here's the plan. So to find f inverse, let's set x is equal to two y plus one cubed. And then I'm going to solve for y. So at every stage, what I've got to do must be an if and only if statement. So it's got to be back and forth. So if I take the cube root of both sides, I'm going to get what? This is an if and only if. 
because the cube root is a one-to-one -one function. Cube root of x is going to be equal to, taking the cube root of this guy, will undo the exponent by my laws of exponents. So now this is if and only if what? 2y is equal to, so take away 1 from both sides. Cube root of x minus 1. So now this is if and only if y is equal to, so let's write it fully, cube root of x minus 1 all divided by 2. So this at the end is the inverse function. Very good. Again, very important you've got if and only ifs at every stage, otherwise this will fail. Okay, so that's the algebraic way to do it. You literally write down y is f of x, you flip the x and y and solve for y. Hey presto, assuming you've done the algebra correct and you are a one-to-one -one function, you'll get the answer. Now, what I really want to do is to think about things graphically because for one thing, this algebra could be incredibly difficult to do. For another, it's really important we understand graphs of functions. So, calculating inverses inverses, we'll do it graphically. So we're not going to get an explicit formula for the inverse, but we are going to get a graph. Okay, so once again, what do we have? y is equal to f of x if and only if x is equal to f inverse of y. That's kind of the defining property of the inverse. So we're back to our kind of notation from before. So what does this mean? Well, basically, what it would mean is the following. It would mean that the graph of y equals f inverse x, so the usual way of writing it, is the graph y is equal to f of x, but with the x and the y interchanged. x and y coordinates. interchanged. That's a little bit hard to wrap your head around. So why is that the case? Why is that the case? That's exactly because this statement here is if and only if x is equal to f of y. So I know it's a bit confusing with the different with the different uses of x and y and that kind of business, but I'm very used to writing graphs y is equal to something in terms of x. So that's the reason I'm kind of focusing on both these examples. So what do I have? So the graph here, what I think is true is if I was to graph this and then somehow interchange the x and y coordinates, that would have to me give, give me the graph of the inverse. Okay, so the question really is at this point, what does this mean, right? What effect does this have? If I take a graph and I exchange the x and the y coordinates, what, what does that look like? So what effect does this have? So what effect does it have? Taking some graph, y is f of x, and somehow flipping the x and y coordinates. So let's take, let's take the x y plane. And let's take a few positions just to see what happens, shall we? So let's imagine I have the position, what will I do it in? I'll do it in green. So imagine I have the position 
minus one one. So minus one one would be up here, let's say. What happens if I flip the coordinates? It becomes one minus one, which is down here, isn't it? Okay. So what happens if I take some other coordinates? What about if I was to take, let's say, let's do zero two. So zero two would be up here. And if I flip this, it's two zero, well that's down here. So if I keep doing this, what I'm actually going to discover is the following. If I was to draw the straight line straight through the origin like this, given by the equation y is equal to x, and I take any point at all, so if I take the point a comma b, let's say, and I write down b comma a, it has to be the reflection across this line. So exchanging the x and the y coordinates, what that does is reflect across this line, y is equal to x. And that's pretty believable. We can see the examples here. If I was to take the position 1, 1, for example, well, 1, 1 would be here. And if I change the coordinates around, it's the same, so you don't move. Of course not. You're in that line. So this tells me what? The graph... The graph of... y equals f inverse of x is going to be the graph of my original function with the x and the y interchanged. So that means reflected, reflected across the line y equals x, this blue line in this picture. So this is a really nice geometric way to interpret this, this interchange of the x and the y coordinates. Really nice. So graphically, well, let me just get this. Graphically, what we're going to do is we're going to graph y is equal to f of x. We're going to graph this blue line. And then we're just going to carefully reflect the whole graph in that straight line. So let's do some examples, shall we? So we've already done two examples algebraically. Why don't we do them graphically now, just to show you it's really true. It's really important you understand this procedure. When we come to trigonometric functions and logarithmic functions, it's vital you understand this procedure. So we've got y, we've got x, and let's graph my straight line that I'm going to reflect across. So this is a line y is equal to x. So originally, so let me just remind us what the functions were up here. So this was in the previous video, actually, but yes, we've got this. So let's do these ones. Let's do x plus 1 and x minus 1. So if I graph x plus 1, what do I get? So I get the straight line up like this. So y is x plus 1. The inverse is x minus 1, which is the reflection in this. So if I graph that, it's going to look like this.
and this is the reflection. So if I take this point, any point here, and I reflect it across this line at right angles, I get this point here. Nice. What about the cube? So if I take the cube root of something, so x cubed, the inverse is the cube root. Let's kind of graph it. So let's do y again. Let's do x. So again, let's draw my line. y is equal to x, this is critical. And now let's do the cube root. So if I do the cube root, what does it look like? So this is the graph for the cube. So the graph for the cube looks like this. It's crossing at one, I think, dot, dot, dot. And then in the opposite direction, let me just copy it. So I can easily reverse it. So that is the graph y is equal to x cubed, roughly. So if I said, what is the graph of the cube root? Well, the cube root is the inverse. So the graph is the reflection of this. And it requires a little bit of thought, but the reflection in this looks like the following. Dot, dot, dot like that. Same story. This is what it looks like when you reflect it. So this is y is equal to the cube root. The cube root of x. So same story as before. If I take this point and I reflect it across this line, I'm getting the other point. It's a right angle there. There. It's actually not the best picture in the world, is it? It's a bit better. So there we go, a reflection across it. Okay, so that's the basics, right? When it comes to graphing functions, you reflect them across this line. So I want to finish by talking about how to deal with scenarios where you aren't one-to-one. -one. So for example, the function x squared is not one-to-one. -one. Minus one squared is equal to one squared is equal to one. It's not one-to-one. -one. But it would be possible to make it one-to-one -one if I was willing to restrict the domain in some way. So I want to talk briefly, this will turn up later on, about restricting domains and partial inverses. So though some functions are not one-to-one, -one, we can perhaps restrict them and make them one-to-one. -one. We can perhaps make them so by restricting the domain. Okay, and in particular, if there is no one-to-one -one function, there's no inverse, remember. So the reason we're doing this is to come up with an inverse, essentially. So no inverse. 
So I just want to show you this by example. We're going to look at this when we do trigonometric functions in detail. But there's a simple example which is going to tie things together. So let's take the example of the square function. So the square function is not 1 to 1. Like I said, minus 1 squared plus 1 squared is equal to 1. But if I was to throw away all the negative numbers, I wouldn't have that problem. So if I restrict x squared to the interval, so I forget about all the negatives. So if I do this, that's 1 to 1 now. Let's draw a picture. I draw a picture what do I get well it would look like this so this is y is equal to x squared but I'm forgetting about the negative stuff right now this is one-to-one -one because it passes the horizontal line test any horizontal line crosses either once or not at all all good it has to be one to one so it has to have an inverse so what is the inverse to this well what would you do well first of all we would draw this line and to graph the inverse you would just take the reflection of this so what's the reflection of it so this is the line y is equal to x as always the reflection of this is going to look like this Dot, dot, dot. Now that's a perfectly valid function. What is it? That is your standard square root function. So when you're talking about the square root, it's not an inverse to x squared. In its sorry, sorry, it's not an inverse to x squared. Not overall. It's not a true inverse to x squared. It's a partial inverse to x squared where we ref we are. Um, restricting the domain of x squared. So really the conclusion of this is square root of x is the inverse to x squared restricted. So it's not a true inverse to the entire square, it's an inverse to the restricted square. Restricted to the interval zero to infinity. So you only get the cancellation properties, for example, when you're doing with positive things, which is exactly what we've seen before. So all of the stuff you're used to works fine, but you have to just be positive. So this is kind of a delicate thing there may be different ways to restrict it for example we could restrict it with the negative terms that's fine what you'd end up getting there would be I suppose minus the square root is the inverse if you drew it carefully something as well about this restriction is you, you do I suppose if you want to do this sensibly restrict in a way that preserves the range right it would be silly otherwise so if you can try to restrict it so the range is preserved that's a kind of a really good way of doing this um, and that works perfectly well here. The range here, if I'm going from 0 to infinity, is still all non-negative numbers, so the range is preserved. So really what you want to do in this case, ideally, is restrict the domain while preserving the range to give you a one-to-one -one function. That will give you some kind of partial inverse.